Um, so, hey everyone. Um, that's my first DEF CON actually. So, smile. <laughs> Okay, um, so today I'm going to present to you a research that we have uh, done last year on Qualcomm driver's code for Android. So uh, our agenda for today, first we'll briefly speak about chipsets, uh, their location in the Android ecosystem, how they affect the overall security of, uh, and how they affect the overall security of Android. Then we'll focus on Qualcomm as a chipset and review its various uh, subsystems. Afterwards, we will reveal four new ODA vulnerabilities that we have recently discovered, including a fully working exploit for one of them. Finally, we will discuss some ideas for improving the overall security of Android. So just a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Adam Donenfeld. I've been a security researcher for years, uh, both in the mobile and in the PC field. I've mainly done uh, vulnerability assessment and exploitation. Uh, right now, I work at Checkpoint as the lead security researcher for Android, and in my free time, I also study German. Uh, additionally, I would like to thank uh, Avi Bashan, Daniel Brody, and uh, Pavel Berengold for supporting me during the research. Okay, so uh, most people think that go only Google is involved in the development of Android, but that's not the case. Many other third-party vendors still take a large part in the final product we buy. Um, the heart of every Android is obviously um, the Linux kernel. Afterwards, we have uh, <coughs> the AOSP, uh, Android Open Source Project, which is developed exclusively by Google. And then things uh, start to get a little bit more complicated because then we have the chipset. So what is actually the chipset? So when you buy an LG, uh, HTC, Nexus, or Samsung device, even though these companies do manufacture some of the hardware, the majority of the hardware is actually manufactured by the chipset vendor. Now, not only the hardware is manufactured by the chipset vendor, uh, but the drivers for this hardware is also a role of the vendor. And then this entire package is uh, forwarded uh, to the OEMs and is modified by each OEM and receives various customizations. And then finally, we, we get our device. Now, as you can see, uh, Chipset is very essential in this process. And if you find a vulnerability in the, chipset, uh, in the chipset code, it means that it has to go through the entire, uh, the, all the OEMs. So does not, uh, it does not only mean a long wait and fix, but also a very large victim pool to attack. So if you find a vulnerability in Qualcomm, we're opposing this to all Nexus, HTC, LG, and many Samsung, Samsung devices. So um, Qualcomm has a very large impact on the overall system. In fact, there are a lot of different subsystems subsystem, which are completely written by Qualcomm. Each one of these subsystems is a great place to start to look for uh, vulnerabilities. And if the component is low level enough in the system, uh, one vulnerability would probably be enough to completely compromise the system. And that's without mentioning uh, components that have been modified by Qualcomm to, satis to, to satisfy its requirements. And we'll see an example soon. Um, so, second. So today, I will be disclosing four new ODE vulnerabilities, each one of them accessible for any unprivileged application on the device. The first one is a Shimanian devil. Uh, the second one is Koala Root, uh, which we already exploited. The third vulnerability is called Sinkoka Root. And the last one is Kanga Root. So let's start with, with uh, Shmanian Devil. So Shmanian Devil is a vulnerability in the ASHMEM mechanism. Uh, ASHMEM, or Android uh, Shared Memory, is a unique shared memory uh, allocator for Android. It reminds a little bit the Linux SAGM mechanism, but with a slightly different behavior, and it supports a very simple uh, file-based API. Now, Qualcomm expanded the functionality of HashMem, the API of HashMem, so it can easily obtain um, an information about a file, a, an HashMem file from an FD. So for example, we use it if you want to map HashMem uh, memory to the GPU. So Qualcomm added this function, so basically, uh, so the, what the function does is it gets a file descriptor, 
and a few output pointers. It extracts from the file descriptor uh, the internal kernel structure of the file. It checks that this file is actually an HMEM file. And if it is, it extracts data uh, from the file. If it's not, the ref count is dropped back, and the function uh, is finished. So it's kind of straightforward. And in fact, we couldn't find a vulnerability there. But a question that most of us uh, must, uh, must ask ourselves is, how does Qualcomm actually verify that our file descriptor is an Ashman file descriptor? So the way to do, that, to do that in Linux is first to extract from the file descriptor the internal uh, structure of the file, which we can see here. Just a second. Uh, which we can see here. And then each file in the, in the system, uh, I mean, for, let's take, for example, a socket file. Each socket in the system has a file. So there are a lot of file types in the system. So in order to determine their type, each socket, each file has its um, operation, a specific operation handler. For example, let's say that we perform a write operation on a socket file. The behavior in comparison to a regular file is obviously different. So we simply have to check, uh, we have to check the, the handler of the specific operation, and then we know the type of the file. So uh, Qualcomm recited, uh, decided to reinvent the wheel, and the way that they checked for a type file um, was by the name of the file. Yeah. If the file is called Ashmem, it must be an Ashmem file, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so what we got here? Uh, if we have a file called Ashmem on the root of any mounting point, we can fake the internal HMEM uh, data. But unfortunately, slash is read only, and any mounting point on the system uh, that uh, is inaccessible for unprivileged applications. And we said that we want to exploit it without any prior permissions. So what we did to overcome that was using uh, a feature called OBB. So OBB, or OPEQ binary blobs, is a, fe a deprecated feature that Fortunately, still works. So as you might know, Google Play doesn't allow apps with file size that is greater than 100 me uh, megabytes. Now, obviously, there are some apps, especially games, that have lots of sounds, uh, textures, pictures, whatever, and they cross the 100 megabyte limitation. Um, so what I usually do is first downloading just the core functionality, and then they download externally and uh, the rest of the textures. So what OB is, is basically a file system that uh, any app can download and mount. And so let's say that we, let's take Angry Birds, for example, of a game. Once we, the first time we, lo we launch Angry Birds, it downloads externally all the, all the pictures and the sounds. And then it just, it downloads an OBB file and it mounts it. So any developer can create an OBB file and put there any file he wants externally download it, and then just mount it on the device. So in order to fake an Ashman file, what we can do is first just create an OBB file and put the file called Ashman in the root uh, directory. Then we can just mount the OBB, and then we can send our file scriptor to the Ashman file from the OBB to the system, and therefore we can fake um, the Ashman uh, internal data. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, now going to the second vulnerability, uh, Koala Root. So Koala Root is a vulnerability in the IPC mechanism of Qualcomm. It's basically a new address uh, family in the system, uh, AF MSM IPC. It has, uh, but it has some unique features. For example, uh, I can whitelist or backlist a uh, blacklist um, other sockets in the system and filter them by uh, the group ID or other um, uh, properties. And therefore, I can prevent unprivileged processes from communicating with me. And now, another cool feature in this IPC, anyone can monitor the entire system. So, for example, I can get a notification for any creation or destruction of a socket with this uh, address family. And the best thing about it, no permissions are required to do that. 
So um, this, this uh, address only has four different uh, subtypes. Uh, we are going to focus only on client port and control port, mainly because IRSC port and server port require um, high privileges. So every time you create a socket, the socket is a client port socket. A client port socket can communicate with other endpoints and send and receive uh, data. Now, control port is an, a socket that cannot communicate with other endpoints. It will only receive messages about the creation or destructions or destruction of sockets in this address family. So how do we create a control port? Um, we simply issue an IOCTL on the client port. So the function that um, handles the IOCTL is this one. Basically, uh, um, it locks the, our current endpoint. So we can't issue two IOCTL simultaneously on the same socket. And then according to our command, it uh, performs operations. So if we issue IPC router IOCTL bind control port, it will be converted from a client port to a control, to a control port. So that's the function that converts uh, our socket. So each type has a list, and the conversion is simply uh, taking out a, a client port from its list and putting it back into, and putting it, putting it into the control port list. So that's the conversion function. And there is a vulnerability here. So let's examine this function uh, step by step and find the vulnerable code. So can you see the code here? Is it visible? OK. So the first uh, instruction is um, taking a lock on the client list. That's because you modified the list. And then we take the object out of it from his list. Then we unlock the client list. We lock the control list. We add our object to the, to the control list, and then we unlock the control list. So let's examine it. Locking the, the client list, taking the object out from his list, unlocking the client list, locking the control list, adding our object there, and then unlocking the control list. Um, pretty straightforward. And in this flow, nothing was um, problematic. But what happens if we try con to convert an object that we have already converted before? So we lock the client list. We take the object out from his list, which is not the client list. We unlock the client list. We lock the control list. We put the object back, and we are unlocking the control list. So for those of you who missed, uh, we, even though we take a lock on the client list, we are modifying without a uh, locking. Uh, we modify uh, the control list. So um, we got something here. The control port list is modified without a lock, and therefore there is a race condition. We can delete two objects simultaneously from the control port list. <laughs> OK. So now, um, just a second, sorry. Let's see what happens when we delete two objects simultaneously from the list. Um, uh, we're, we're working in the context of A. Uh, that's the Linux kernel code that removes objects from a uh, double-linked list. And if you, can see it, if you can see it, so you have the pseudocode here. So basically, uh, we are taking now A is next, which is B. And we set B is prev to be A is prev. So B is prev equals control ports. And now, since the list is not locked, there might be a context switch. So uh, now we're working on the context uh, of B. So we take B is next, which is C, and we set C is prev to be B is prev. So C is prev equals control ports. And now we have to take care of um, B is prev, which is control, pro uh, which is, um, uh, control ports. The second. Yeah, you have to take care here, sorry. So we set control ports next to be B's next. So control ports next equals C. And finally, B is B now points to poison and remove, is removed from the list. And it's not re just removed from the list, but it is also freed. So now this memory is reclaimable by kernel heap spraying or any other method you choose. And now uh, going back to A. Uh, we take care of A is prev, so control ports next equals B. And just like B, 
A is removed from the list, it will now point to poison, and uh, that's it. So if we uh, remove all the unused object in this list, you get this. So the list now points to a free reclaimable by kernel heap spraying data. So uh, we just use uh, Unix diagrams to spray that. Now since this is the list of the control ports, now once we fake an object there, we want the list to be used. So we just create or destroy any endpoint in this address family. Because, and each time we do that, all the objects on this list must be mod uh, notified about that. So the notifying function is post packet to port. So each object in the control ports list is transferred to the post packet to port uh, function. So that's the function. Uh, we're not going to go over, uh, through, uh, over, uh, all over it. But as you can see here, we have a lot of new primitives from information disclosure to function calls, uh, memory corruption, and many other um, primitives. I think that there is at least one more way to exploit the vulnerability, but the path that we chose was using wake up. So what is wake up? Wake up is actually a macro to another function called uh, wake up common. Uh, as you can see here, since we control um, the first parameter of wake up, we also control Q. Now, task list is derived from Q, so therefore we control, we control cur. So we have a new primitive here. We, ca we can call any kernel function um, on the, uh, we can ca call any kernel function while we control uh, a large por portion of the first parameter. Now, if we wouldn't have smap, it would be uh, a game over, but we want to uh, we we overcome smap. So, a new primitive, uh, kernel function call with the first, with the first parameter contr uh, controllable. However, uh, it's not good enough for commit creds. Commit creds, for those of you who don't know, is a kernel function that allows you to change your current credentials. Now, since we control most but not all of the first parameter, we can't call commit creds because we want full capabilities. That's because the kernel address is a part of the first parameter. So if you want to control the accurate kernel address, we cannot control 100% of the first parameter. So we had to upgrade our primitive. We have to find a function that controlling just a little bit of its first parameter will allow us to call another function uh, with 100% control over um, its parameters. So we looked for such a function, and we got USB read done work FN. Um, as you can see here, we control work, so we control SH, CH. Controlling CH allows us to control REC, and therefore we can call any function while we have 100% control of the first parameter. Uh, so buff is an address, so we can just put any pointer here. And so each time we want to call a kernel function now, we have to go through over, 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 this, over this, this chain. So first we call a uh, wake up common, which you can see here. Then we call using this function, we call USB read done work fn. And finally we can call any kernel function uh, and while controlling uh, the first parameter. And now we have enough uh, primitives to completely compromise the system, get ourselves root, disable SLinux, Linux, and clean up our mess. So uh, let's start again, exploitation flow. We have a list, uh, a double linked list, and each time we create or destroy an endpoint on the list, the list is iterated, and we, uh, we can, uh, it will be used. So the first thing that we want to do is get the use after free situation that we saw before using the vulnerability, and therefore put a fake object there. So first we, um, so there is a free object in the list. Now, uh, since this memory is reclaimable, we can just can, uh, use heap spring to uh, reclaim this data. We used Unix diagrams, but again, you can choose your uh, convenient, uh, convenient uh, spring method. And now we control this object. Sorry. Control this object, and the next thing we want to do is get the system to use this object. So trigger, trigger an iteration on the list. So we just close or create any socket on this endpoint, and the list, uh, our object is being used, and then we go to the function chain call. We go to, uh, to wake up common, 
which uses our fake task list, and then we can call uh, kernel functions uh, conveniently. So the first fun function that we call is QDisk list del. Um, it cleans up the list, so our fake object will no longer be there. In fact, the list will be just empty. So for, for the use of the list, nothing will crash. Then we call enforcing setup, which uh, effectively sets SCLinux to be permissive. And finally, we call commit creds, which sets our UID to zero and gives us the full available cap uh, capabilities of on, uh, available to the system. And we won. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And now, um, time for a demo. So uh, <laughs> on the left, we have a console. I hope you can see it. But you will really have to believe me. Uh, first, we install uh, our demo app. Um, now, uh, and we are going to see that this device is uh, a Marshmallow device with a relatively new Linux kernel version. <clears throat> now, uh, and additionally, we're going to see that SE Linux is fully enforced. Uh, and that uh, SuperSU is not installed on the device, so it's not rooted. It actually comes like from the store like that. And um, we're going to see that we are not root, so it's, we, are, we are running on the user 2000, so shell. Um, okay, now our payload, same, uh, our pay, uh, payload uh, put a SUID file in the system partition. And it creates a service, a local, a local a netcat server, listening on port 1337, which, simp which just forwards commands to um, bash as root. So now we're going to see that system is not modified and that this local server uh, does not exist. Okay, and now we're going to launch our exploit. Uh, so we're going to see some crap on that uh, log cat. Uh, <laughs> be patient. That's it. We're out. So now it just uh, cleans up stuff. Uh, the entire and uh, it takes approximately two seconds to exploit this um, vulnerability, and then you get, a, you can run your own payload uh, as root without nothing inter uh, that uh, stands on your way. So now we are going to see that um, we are still not root, you don't have like a SU, and we are not root yet, but S Linux is now no longer enforcing, it's permissive. And if we try to netcat to our local server, instead of getting connection refused, we are in. So now we see that system has a new file called sogang that's access in German. I'm studying German. <laughs> and we're going to see now fstab, which is only accessible to uh, root. So, and finally, ID shows that we run as the kernel, and <laughs> boy, my returns root. Um, thank you. Uh, so that was Quarroot, and now we are going to uh, the last two vulnerabilities, Sinococa root and uh, G uh, Kanga root. But before we talk about them, uh, we have to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about a, mod uh, a mechanism called IDR. So IDR is a Linux kernel mechanism, so it's not just for Android, and it allows mapping between numbers, like just IDs, two kernel pointers. When do you use that? Uh, let's say that we want to let the user uh, reference kernel object, so we don't want to reveal the kernel address of this object, so we just give them uh, an, a safe ID. So how does it look? Uh, the user wants to create an object, so it sends the kernel a create object request. Now the kernel allocates data and initializes a new object. Now the kernel doesn't want to give back this address to the user. So instead of, instead of doing this, it just uh, passes this address to the IDR mechanism, which now maps between this address and the number one. And now the number one is returned to the user, and each time the user wants to update the object, 
uh, destroy the object, do whatever it wants to do the object. It will send the kernel uh, just, hey, I want to update this object, object ID, ID 1. And the kernel uh, will use the IDO mechanism to get the address from this one. And now, uh, syncoca root. So syncoca root is a vulnerability in an object called sync source, uh, in an object called sync source. Uh, it's in the synchronization mechanism between the GPU and the currently running apl application. We don't have to know a lot about this object to understand and see the vulnerability. We just have to see how to create and destroy this object. And as you've seen before, the IDR mechanism, this object is referenced with the IDR mechanism. So that's the function that destroys, that frees the object. Um, uh, the user controls data. I mean, it, it is sanitized, so actually it just controls uh, ID here. And KGSL sync source gets, obtains from this ID, this IDR ID, a kernel object uh, called sync source. Now, how does it work here? It's a ref count based object. So first, uh, the, the, object, the ref count is one. Once we, did that, what we, once we called this function, the ref count is increased to two. Then it is dropped once for the creation of the object because it's the destroying function. And it, it is called once again because we increase the ref count here. So at this point, the object is freed. But something is missing here. Is there any pending free check um, on the object? What happens if we call this, uh, this function on two different threads simultaneously? So let's examine it. We have thread, uh, thread A and thread B. Thread A called uh, the destroying function. So now the ref count is two. Now it drops the ref count uh, to one. And then there, may, there might be a context, a context switch. So thread B now calls the destroy function. Now the ref count is going again to two, but immediately they dropped back to one. Then we are going back to thread A, which drops the, drops the ref count to zero. And on this point, the object is freed, reclaimable, and any kernel, kernel uh, heap spring will catch it. And finally, uh, since thread B did not finish the destroy sequence, the ref count will be dropped to a minus one. And on this point, once the ref count is zero, we can cause another object, our, our malicious fake object, to be freed. And then we can further it. So again, the POC. And uh, we are creating an object and a sync source object. And we create, we create two threads which call destroy, which use the destroy function on the object simultaneously. The ref count will be dropped to minus one. Before it gets to minus one, it's on zero. And then we can uh, hip spray the kernel, catch it, and we have a double free, which leads to use after free. So that was in Cocker root. Uh, now, finally, uh, Kangaroo root. So uh, kangaroo is a vulnerability um, in the KGSL minus 3D O uh, zero um, mechanism. It's the wrapper between uh, the user mode and the GPU. Um, so each time we map um, data to the GPU, another object called KGSL mem entry is allocated, and this object uh, manages the address range, the range that is uh, mapped, uh, how many. Uh, object like a ref count, a protection level, and many other properties. And again, if you want to unmap this data, we can use the IDR mechanism because the mappings are, mapped, are used by the IDR mechanism. So the first th thing that we did was going to the destroy function. And we saw this, which looked pretty cool because there was, al there was also no pending check on the, um, on the destroy sequence. And then we went to shared mem free entry. And for some reason, unfortunately, they didn't forget to do that here, so it's appropriately um, locked. So we don't have the same vulnerability again. So in, frustra in frustration, we went to the create a creating object. So uh, this, is, uh, this uh, uh, function gets, I told the KGSL mem entry, so we just get blob of data. It associates this, this data with, the, uh, with an IDR, uh, with an ID using the IDR mechanism, and then it, is, it initializes uh, the data. It maps it to the GPU, and it adds it to some lists. So that's not appropriately locked. Why? Because 
once we associate, we associate it with an IDR number, it is already be a ref a, we can already reference it from the, user, uh, from the user mode. So here is how we use this object. Fred A creates some, uh, it allocates some data. It, it's already, uh, everything here is, by the way, in the kernel already. So uh, Fred A uh, allocates data. It associates the, um, the, the data with an IDR number, so anyone can reference it now, and then it initializes uh, the data. Then Fred B, it, it checks for if the IDR item exists, and since it is, it passes this check and frees the data. But what happens? <laughs> what happens if Fred A allocates the data, associates it with an IDR number, and right then, Fred B uh, uh, issues a uh, release uh, a free request on this object. The object is already there, so we pass the if check, and then the object is freed. So even though the object is freed and reclaimable again by kernel hip spring, Fred A did not finish yet. So now uh, free not unused data, which can be used by us, will be initialized, and we have another use after free. So again, uh, the POC, uh, first we map data, data to the GPU, we get a number, and we are going to know which, is, which number will be next, because as you can see here, it is always increased by one. And then we issue simultaneously a create request and a free request on another thread. And, and there might be, again, a user to free in the function kgsl mem entry attach process on the entry parameter. <laughs> um, so that's a POC. Now, uh, disclosure. So obviously we disclose everything. We had a collaboration both with Google and with Qualcomm. And I must say that Qualcomm was very responsive. They, uh, were, and very, uh, they were very co uh, collaborative. So uh, since Cocoa Root was fixed uh, on the fixed 6th of July, a uh, patch was released. And Google deployed it to the Nexus devices on the 6th of July also. Um, Kangaroot was also fixed uh, on the 6th of July, um, but for some reason it was only fixed on, on, on it, the patch was only deployed uh, on the 1st of August. Um, Ashmani and Devil, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Even though Qualcomm released, released a patch, uh, no device was fixed so far, at least not, that, no, not no OEM that we know about, so you're all vulnerable. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, uh, Qualwood. So I, uh, Qualwood was, uh, was the first vulnerability that we disclosed, and even though Qualcomm released a patch back in April, Google did, did not deploy it yet. And I would like to talk about Google for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so um, despite the average bug report, which usually contains a document and five lines of code in the best case, we supply them with a fully working exploit for any Qualcomm-based device. And they classified Qualroot as a low severity vulnerability. Now, what the hell? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we should have an exploit. So we approached Google and we asked them why they classified this rep the, our vulnerability as a low severity vulnerability. And you know what they said? They said that they planned to block this mechanism using, uh, using, using an S Linux rule in the future. So we sent it to them. It was vulnerable all on, the, on all the devices, and yet they said, yeah, in the future we'll fix that. So just a matter of timing, sorry. Um, so maybe I hope that it will, be, it, will, it, won't, it will be different for the next time. And this is just a single example. I mean, that, that's like a working, that's a proof that it's possible. We might have out there low severity vulnerabilities which are exploitable and it poses a very high risk on all our Android devices. So, uh, suggestions for the future. And I'm not going to say pay, attention, pay more attention to your code because it will never, it, that's, that's not an, a practical uh, suggestion. I'm going to give you concrete suggestions. So, uh, the first one, 
for more than a, for more than a decade, commit credits was an extremely convenient function for exploiters. I mean, back in 2008, people did that. So maybe we can somehow harden it. Let's take Cisco Reboot, for example. It actually receives magics. So you can't call Cisco Reboot by mistake. So maybe we can harden it, make it inline, put magics, but this function cannot be in the kernel anymore. Not in this current situation. Now, my second advice, um, KSLR. So ASLR is not a new concept. iPhones are also running ARM and they have it for years. New Linux kernels do support ASLR and yet for some reason, Android, device, uh, Android users don't enjoy from this benefit. So I really think that KSLR for Android should be prioritized. Without KSLR, it would be much more complicated to exploit Qualaroot and I think every other kernel vulnerability. Um, the last uh, advice, uh, um, so S Linux is a very, a really great me uh, mechani security mechanism and it greatly decreased decrease the attack surface. Uh, but still, I don't think that unprivileged applications should have access to Qualcomm's internal IPC. And even though it's nice to have it, but we should pay more attention to the rules that we deploy there. Now, with that said, the overall, uh, current, uh, the overall uh, status of Android is fairly good. SMAP, or PXN for, for ARM, which was introduced last year, made everything much more complicated. And yet, a few small components are missing to make everything much more safe. Now, um, we, created an app, we created an app which should be published like now. So it is called Quadroot Scanner. You can check, using, the, using this uh, app, you can check if your device is vulnerable. Now, for Ashmeni and Devil, it must be, but you know, for the rest of them, you might be surprised if, there it's, um, if it's like that or not, if it's vulnerable. So it is also searchable on the Google page, just quad root uh, scanner. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And <laughs> so we have like five, how many, how much time? Like we have minutes. like, so, so we have like five, 10 minutes for Q&A. So if you wanna, if you have a question, just Q in front of the microphone and ask. How many devices do you think are affected by these vulnerabilities? So the question was how many devices are affected by this vulnerability, by, by these vulnerabilities. So a few hundreds of millions, I think about, about 700, 800 millions, more or less. No, a small number. <laughs> Hey, awesome work. I was wondering if you've looked into any of the Qualcomm OSs, like the radio OS, RPMB, uh, yeah. or touch any of the non-Linux Can you repeat? Stuff. I couldn't hear you very, very well. Hey, I'm wondering if you've looked into any of the uh, Qualcomm other OSs that run on a device, the non-Linux OSs, like RPMB, uh, uh, TZ, uh, or any of the non-Linux stuff that's running? I, okay. Yeah, we actually, we weren't sure about it, but since, for example, um, qua uh, the Android wearables like the watch, since they also use the same, okay, for at least for Qualcomm, since it's not ARC-based, just logical code, I mean, not logical, but it's not based on the CPU, um, we do believe that it might be vulnerable. We did not check that, though. So, we're welcome to do that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, on the demonstration, I noticed the security patch string was from October of 2015. Is there a reason you didn't demonstrate against the latest version? Um, not really. Uh, we discovered it back in like January, and that's the device in January, and February. So that's the device. That's like we just took it from this uh, date. But um, <clears throat> there is no reason for that. I mean, on the latest versions. Uh, Google did deploy a, uh, a Linux um, world that blocks access to the Qualcomm IPC, but 
you can just, you, you can, I mean, if you disable SC Linux, so it's exploitable and it is indeed vulnerable. I mean, it, the devices did not receive a patch yet. Uh, did you get Trust Zone access at all through? Okay, so um, once you're root, you, can, you have access to the uh, Trust Zone me uh, Trust Zone mechanism. This vulnerability is, however, in the unsecure un un kernel uh, context, and therefore it does not give you access to the Trust Zone kernel. However, you can exploit previously disclosed vulnerabilities yeah. Yeah. to achieve this, uh, the uh, code execution in the Trust Zone level, awesome. as seen on other research, uh, uh, research on the internet. Cool. Cheers. Um, other questions? Um, thank you. Yeah.